Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. On the 10th day of the Israel-Hamas conflict, we present a voice from Israel that is renowned for its courage and outspokenness. My guest is the internationally acclaimed columnist of the Haaretz newspaper, the winner of the Olaf Palm Prize and the Sokolov Award, as well as the author of The Punishment of Gaza, Gideon Levy. Mr. Levy, today is the seventh day of the Israel-Hamas conflict. Before I come to specific questions and issues, let me ask you, how do you personally view what's happening? It's, it's a big question. It's not a small question. Uh, there is a wider scale in which you, you have to see the context. The context is that the Gaza Strip is put in a siege for now 17 years. 2.3 million people are living in a cage. That's almost an experiment in human beings. And this terrible experience creates all kinds of mutations. One of the mutations is this barbaric attack on Israeli settlements and towns and villages last Saturday, which was really barbaric. Nothing justifies such an attack. But in the same time, we have to understand that the siege could have not last forever. And this was a very, very bloody reminder that the siege and the occupation and the apartheid cannot last forever without Israel paying a heavy price for them. This reminds me of what you wrote in your column for Haaretz on the 9th of October. You were describing Israel's treatment of the Palestinian people, not just in recent years, but going back perhaps 15, 20 or decades. You wrote, and I'm quoting you, we'll fire at innocent people, take out people's eyes and smash their faces, expel, confiscate, rob, grab people from their beds, carry out ethnic cleansing, and of course, continue with the unbelievable siege of the Gaza Strip and still believe everything will be all right. You're suggesting, are you, that Israel, in a sense, with this policy towards the Palestinians was playing with fire. There's no other way to describe it. Once you do those things, you have to pay a price because no people in history gave up, gave up dignity, gave up self-determination, gave up human rights. And to expect the Palestinians to do so is being disconnected from history and disconnected from reality. So are you in a sense saying that though what Hamas did on Saturday is inhuman, unforgivable, and it must be condemned, nonetheless, people should bear in mind that there is a background which does not justify what Hamas has done, but it does explain it, and it's important to keep that background in mind. I couldn't phrase it better than this. Because I notice again, in a column you wrote on the 12th, that's just yesterday, you sort of seemed to me to be speaking directly to the Israeli people about the Palestinians. You said, how is it possible to forget 
that these are human beings whose ancestors were expelled from their land and placed in refugee camps where they would remain. You said these were human beings who Israel dispossessed and expelled, whom it conquered again in their land of refuge and then turned into animals in a cage. Were you reminding your countrymen that this is what we've done to the Palestinians? Don't forget it. We shouldn't forget it, not only because of moral considerations, which I don't underestimate for sure not. We should also remember it if we have any intention to get to a solution one day. If Israel believes that the only solution is a military one, only living on the sword, only living on military power and, and brutal actions, then we will not get to anywhere. The only way to get one day, and this day is very far right now, to any kind of just solution is to understand the roots of everything. And everything has roots and have, everything has some kind of context. Israelis prefer not to see it because it's much easier just to say the Palestinians were born to kill and we can't do anything about it. This in many... Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was no. going to say, when you give such a message to the Israeli people, particularly at this moment, when they are both stunned and angry, how does that message go down with your countrymen? They, uh, many people are angry and other people are supportive. Uh, it's not the first war that I'm raising my voice. And hopefully it's not the last war. I mean... Hopefully it is the last war, but it will not be the last war that I will raise my voice. And uh, my voice is uh, qu quite a whistle in the darkness because there are not so many Israelis who share my views. Actually, there are very few. But I feel that that's what I should do now. That's my duty. Now, for over 15 years, Benjamin Netanyahu has been Prime Minister of Israel since December He's been dependent upon some of the most right-wing parties in your country, including men like Ben Gavir and Smotrich. In an article you wrote on the 9th, just after the Hamas attack, you said Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu bears very great responsibility for what happened and he must pay the price. To an Indian audience who isn't familiar with the details, could you explain that further, please? Look, uh, Netanyahu is the prime minister for the last 15 years, and he, he led the policy. And the policy was to ignore the Palestinian issue, to try to get agreements with other Arab countries, but to totally deny that the core issue is the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian people. In, under his control, the army was totally invested in guarding settlers in the West Bank, abandoning all the other fronts, mainly the front with Gaza. Then came the surprise, which was also his responsibility because he's the prime minister. And if an army is surprised in such a shameful way like he did, it all goes to him. And right now I can tell you anger toward him raises peaks that he never faced before, but people say, let's finish with the war first. He will not survive the protest after this war. I noticed that on the 8th, your paper, Haaretz, not only squarely blamed Netanyahu for what it called the disaster that befell Israel, but it went on to accuse the government of annexation and dispossession, words that you've used in your own op-eds, and it also accused the government of a foreign policy which ignores the existence and rights of the Palestinians. That's a very powerful critique. How widely is it shared? It's spreading now more and more widely because you, as you know, as you definitely know, the protest against Netanyahu started much before this. The change now is that many right-wingers join this protest because they have to admit that Israel went through a fiasco, not less than a fiasco. And when there is a fiasco, someone has to pay for it. Someone must be taken accountable. Unfortunately, until this very moment, Netanyahu doesn't seem 
to show any signs of taking any kind of responsibility for what happened, and therefore the anger will only in- increase against him. Does this mean that although at the moment, in the immediate sense, politicians have united around the government, there's a government of national unity, there's a sense of crisis in the country, but are we nonetheless looking down the road and can we see the end of his political career in sight? I have no doubt about it. It's only a question of time. I think he understands it by himself. The anger and the frustration which will be directed at him is something that he will not be able to survive. It might take time. Those are processes. But finally, the Israeli street will not bear him anymore. Now, as we speak, the Israeli defense forces are amassing on the borders of Gaza. And they have already issued instructions that Gaza City must be evacuated. Everyone must go south and they can only return to Gaza City when they are permitted to do so. In fact, the UN has separately announced that Israel wants all of Gaza north of Wadi Gaza to be vacated in 24 hours. But talking of 1.1 million people, possibly 500 million children. First of all, how do you view this step? And secondly, what does this suggest about what's about to happen? I'm very afraid that we are facing one of the biggest crime of war that Israel had ever committed, if it's going to implement it. It will be a second Nakba. What is described, what is described here is no less than a second Nakba to expel one million people within 24 hours without any guarantee that they will ever have a place to get back is a collective punishment in a scale that I don't remember, in Israel at least. They did it in Nagorno-Karabakh a few weeks ago, and even there it was a smaller scale. I really hope that someone will stop Israel. If not, we are, I'm really scared we are going to face a horrible catastrophe that we never faced before. Do you have any sense of how your countrymen view this order to evacuate 1.1 million people in just 24 hours? And remember, we're talking about the elderly who may not be able to go, the young who find it difficult, people in hospital, people who are injured. How do your countrymen view this order to evacuate in 24 hours? I hope they don't mean it, but if they mean it, it is, um, it shows about their values. This is what I can say. And the fact that most of Israeli public opinion will support it makes it much harder. What will be the Palestinian response, particularly in the West Bank, if the Israel army were to enter, some people say invade Gaza, and then seek to hunt down Hamas house to house. What will be the response in the West Bank? And do you have any sense of what will be the response from Hezbollah in Iran? I think Hezbollah in Iran is much more crucial. This can be a game changer and the challenge that Israel never faced before. The West Bank they in the past never get out of its way in times of war in Gaza. Maybe it's the very tied up Israeli hold there, which prevented it from happening, but it never happened before that the West Bank really went wild, except of demonstrations and protests and some low-scale operations. It's very hard to tell. We are facing a very, very explosive period. Could this, if it happens, an invasion in courts of Gaza lead to the conflict spreading regionally with Hezbollah and Iran coming in and maybe other Arab countries not coming in, but perhaps voicing with greater uh, force their concern and their support for the Palestinians? Fortunately or unfortunately, most of the Arab countries do, do, do not really support the Palestinians except of lip service. And I don't see it happening now. They abandoned the Palestinians a long time ago. And the Palestinians know it, that they have no one to rely on in the Arab world. Also, Iran and Hezbollah 
don't do it for the sake of the Palestinians. They do it only for their own uh, interests. Don't think that Hezbollah cares so much about the Palestinians or Iran cares so much about the Palestinians. But this is irrelevant. All the things you described might, might become true. And in very few days, we might really see a new reality in the Middle East. So in other words, we could be at the brink of a much wider conflict. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the probability for this is unfortunately very high. On Wednesday, the Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said, and I'm quoting him, Gaza will never go back to what it was. It will change 180 degrees. Two days earlier on Monday, Prime Minister Netanyahu said, we are going to change the Middle East forever. How do you as an Israeli who lives in the Middle East view this prospect? I, I don't take too much seriously those uh, arrogant uh, declarations which we heard many times before. I will judge them according to what they will do and not according to what they say. Uh, that's the easy part. The, the problem is that they might implement it this time and then it's, it's a new reality. This could also provoke, I imagine, other people, whether it's Hezbollah, Iran or others. It could also affect the attitude of Saudi Arabia, which at the moment has not been very critical of Israel. But if this happens, I imagine its attitude could change. I'm not sure because Saudi Arabia is there not because of the love to Israel, but because of the fear from Iran and the special relations with the United States. Those interests will not change. But obviously, if there will be a real massacre in Gaza, even Saudi Arabia, who does not care too much about the Palestinians, will not be able to ignore it. In the article you wrote for your paper, Haaretz on the 9th, you asked a question very forcefully about whether Israel has learned its lesson. I'm quoting for the sake of the Indian audience. You wrote, will Israel learn its lesson? No, you answered. The threats of flattening Gaza prove only one thing. We haven't learned a thing. The arrogance is here to stay, even though Israel is paying a high price once again. Are you saying that because no lesson has been learned, what we're seeing could possibly happen again and again? More than this, I think this is the most probable uh, scenario. Any other scenario is less probable. I'd be surprised if Israel is, will draw the lesson. Until now, I don't see any signs for it. Which means that Israel will then remain a sieged, embattled country, surrounded by neighbors who are wary and with a population that it cannot trust and doesn't like it. Not only it cannot trust and doesn't like it, it's equally in size with the Jewish uh, population. Don't forget that today, between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, including Gaza, there are around 7.5 million Jews and 7.5 million Palestinians. Do you think it is sustainable to keep them in this situation? I doubt it very much. So what sort of future does Israel look when it sees itself in the mirror? It doesn't look for a future, or in other words, it doesn't answer your question. Israelis don't think what will be here and where are we aiming it. Is that because they're, are they therefore in denial? Oh, that's the biggest secret of Israeli society is living with a long-standing denial. Sure, they live in total denial. What about your major friends in Europe and America? Surely the truth you're sharing with me must be known to them, whether they talk about it publicly or not. Don't they want to nudge and push the Israeli government towards acceptance of reality and a change of policy? They are ready to pay some lip service, but not more than this. The world, Europe, the United States never took measures. It's only about condemnation, some kind of political and diplomatic pressure, nothing but this. And without actions, nothing will change. But this sounds very depressing. Do, do I seem not depressive? And the worst part of it 
is that your countrymen seem to be in denial or simply not aware, and the government doesn't seem to care, and the rest of the world isn't waking up your government. So you're all on your own, looking at the abyss and in terrible danger of falling in. Let's hope that the shock of this trauma will change something, even though we'll scratch a little bit under the skin of the Israelis, even though I'm not sure at all. Quite right. That's a hope, but you don't believe it will necessarily happen. It's a bit like Nadezda Mandelstam in her book, Hope Against Hope. Exactly. Exactly. Tell me, in the Financial Times this morning, David Grossman, the author, wrote the following sentence. He said, Israel after the war will be much more right-wing, militant, and racist. Do you fear that could happen? Yes, absolutely. It might happen, and therefore I'm so skeptical and pessimistic. Which means far from learning lessons, Israel could go further down the same bad road and become even worse in terms of the situation and plight it faces. Absolutely. My last question. After what's happened, do you believe it's still possible for Israel and Palestine to live side by side as peaceful neighbors? Or does that look unlikely, not just for several years, but possibly decades, maybe generations? Right now, it seems totally impossible. On the other hand, it's no less impossible to maintain an apartheid system forever. So, you know, in our part of the world, the best thing is to understand that we have to be realistic enough to believe in miracles. And only miracles can now change the picture. The picture is very, very, very much not promising, I must tell you. We are in one of our darkest hours. Mr. Levy, you phrased that beautifully. We have to be realistic enough to believe in miracles. Most people would say believing in miracles is not realism. But what exactly. you're saying is you're inverting it and saying the only hope is a miracle. Which shows you how small is this hope. Thank you very much indeed for opening Thank our you. eyes. And let me applaud the courage with which you speak and the outspokenness. I come from a country where at the moment, courage and outspokenness and criticizing the government is simply rewarded with punishment. I hope I know. that will never be the case in your country. Stay safe and take care. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.